Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of today's Medical Sales Leader, where I have guests come on and share the real behind the scenes tips that you need to operate in the modern world of medical sales. And today is no different. I have an incredible guest with me here today. His name is Marcus Chan. And if you haven't followed Marcus Chan yet, I highly encourage you to do. He gives away all the goods when it comes to becoming a major player in sales, especially earning six figures, really refining your approach and learning how to develop systems that will support you quickly and for the long term. So Marcus, I've had the unique opportunity to interview you now three times and I'm so <laughs> blessed. So thank you so much for entertaining me one more time. Oh, Claire, hey, I'm excited to be here. We always have fun. We always run out of time and I expect probably today will be no different <laughs> than any other time. I'm pumped to be here. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. I feel really grateful to have you with me again today. I think a lot of people are wondering, what are we going to talk about today? First of all, if you haven't grabbed Marcus's book, I'm shamelessly going to demand that you do so right now. We were just talking about this behind the scenes because how you can grab a lot of different sales theory books. Marcus gives you a playbook right here, and it can apply to all kinds of different markets and industries. So do yourself a favor and grab it today. And uh, Marcus, thanks for creating such an awesome second bestseller. Uh, I appreciate that. It was pretty cool to um, put together, right? Because ultimately I put together for those out there who want a playbook to actually X can actually go and print some money and have a lot of fun doing it. That's so awesome. And you did not disappoint. This thing is absolute gold down to how you can analyze personal personality types before you go into a cold call. And I think that is something that maybe we start off with that at the beginning, because at the core, if we're going to apply this kind of sales strategy to any market, I feel like that's something that everybody needs to know. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. So I think one of the most important things is most salespeople have a certain way of doing things. And it's not that it's necessarily wrong, but if you've ever felt, oh, I do, I'm just better with this type of prospect, you're probably right because of your personality type and how that, pro that person, uh, that prospect is like. But then when you get in front of somebody else, it's, oh, it's really hard to sell this type of person. And the average rep is just, that's just the way things are. But the elite sales professional understand, okay, how can I lean into my strengths, but also be aware of my weaknesses and adjust the personality type of the prospect. And I really break it into four types of personality types. And depending on which personality studies you've looked into, there's many out there. I kind of like generally buck into four. And when I go through them, some of you might be like, I think I'm more of this than that. Sometimes it's a blend. All right. So it's not necessarily, there's nothing that's binary. It's not one or the other. It's usually a blend. All right. So for example, so number one is analytical. So an analytical decision maker, they're like usually pretty much in the weeds. They want to know numbers. They ask a lot of questions. They're very specific. They're very particular. They get in like the nitty gritty of things. That's a really common decision maker that you'll have, especially at the really high up level, generally speak. Then you have a director style, like my personality. So they're very direct. Like they're very short. They're very concise with you. They're very, they don't like, they don't want you to BS them around. They don't like fluff. They want you to get right to the point. And some, in fact, sometimes when they talk to you, you might feel like they're trying to bulldoze you and mm. it, it, you feel run over by that. And it's not because they don't like you. That just might be just how they operate. So they're usually very busy, very hurried. They're always like ready to go take an action pretty quickly, right? Then there's like expressive. Expressive is, you can see they have more personality. They're more open. They're friendly. They're these colorful language. And they just have a personality that's very vibrant and they're very visionary in how they talk and they don't usually get into the weeds or details and then you have the more emotional feeling based one it was more interpersonal which they are you can tell by the the word they use feel they might be soft spoken they care about how other people feel and it's not necessarily a bad thing as well they're amiable right we can kind of guide them as well and when you understand that there's four personality types whatever you want to call them then you can adjust your style right because of how you perceive them for example even when you walk especially in the field sales world if you can see their office, you can tell pretty quickly what's important. So for mm -hmm. example, like typically a director style, they love status, recognition, accolades, etc. That's my style. I like to win. I play to win. I'm very direct. I'm right to the point. I hate fluff. And yeah. that can drive some people the wrong way, right? And especially if I'm on a sales call, if they're more soft-spoken and more amiable, if I just take over and start dominating that conversation, that could totally turn them off. I made the mistake early on. 
right. or if they're also a director like mentality and now you might go head to head <laughs> so there's a balance of how you adjust it but the key is when you understand that and for every prospect so not just the decision maker but the gatekeeper the yeah. office manager anybody you talk to and you realize they each have their own personality type it's like how can you adjust it what language do they speak and how can you identify a language and speak their language that's so critical and i really like that you bring that up in your book because with without a doubt in any industry it applies but in medical sales i think there's this feeling of because it's so difficult to access doctors since 2020 but really it went earlier than that. The last 10 years, gatekeepers have been becoming tighter and tighter with who gets let back in the office and who gets access to the OR. And we have this idea that a doctor is just this hard driver. He's really elusive and he's hard to get a hold of. And he probably just doesn't want to talk to me. But really, if we leaned into these different personality types, like you're saying, then it would make each step of the process easier. And I think we would understand our client better. Percent. One of the things that I know that medical sales reps and managers both have a ton of trouble with right now is access. Almost mm -hmm. every single client that I work with is having a heck of a time in the first five minutes, they'll say something to the effect of access has been really hard, but in the last two years, it's been absolutely closed. So now what? So I'd love to hear if you could give advice to a rep or a manager even who was trying to guide their team on new ways to get access to these hard to reach decision makers, where should they start? What's something new they should be trying? Great question. So first off, how we view it's really important. So a lot of people don't realize this, but this is actually good. And here's what I mean by that. When it's really hard to get a hold of decision makers, especially for in the medical field, that means hard for everyone else as well. So that becomes now a competitive advantage. When the barrier entry is high, that gives you an opportunity to become better. And the mistake a lot of reps make is they're like, oh, it's too hard. Like they just complain about it, right? Which, yeah, that's okay. It's okay if it's hard. It now becomes a barrier of entry. And what's really cool is because it's hard, once you're able to actually break free, earn the trust and earn the business, they're going to stay with you so much longer because no one else can break in. It becomes a moat for your business as well. So when you understand that and you perceive it that way, you're more willing to do the work it takes to actually break free. And I'm just going to share with you a few different ways you can break through, but I want to share with you just context because I talked to a lot of medical device sales professionals or even pharma, and they're kind of like, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. It's so hard. It is hard for sure. But there are also more tough situations. And I'll give you a specific example. Even as a rep going in the field, there were businesses I would call on where you would try to pull up and there's a security guard at the very front. So you got to go through the security. Or sometimes there's no security guard. It's just completely locked. Either have scanned a barcode and you can see the building. You can see the building. You can see there's plenty of vehicles and you can see that there's a big thrive. There's a huge opportunity, but you can't even get through the door. You call the main <laughs> line. It's just a main line. There's no right. phone directory or anything. Yeah. But the reality is like those are again moats. Those are moats to the business, right? So now it's like, how do you actually break free and break through? And there's many different ways you can do it, right? So like, for example, like if you're actually, number one, have you done your homework on the prospect? Have you identified the best possible way to actually get their information? Whether it's a main line, or if you could buy a cell number, which I know some people would call cell numbers, but you have to lean towards discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. You do not get paid to be comfortable, right? Like you do yes. not get paid to be comfortable. Can you get their email address? It's shocking how, like. It's like, if you just did a little bit of homework or if you have access to today, you get to buy a lot of email addresses, right? Mm -hmm. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Or you can reverse hack it. Meaning, let's just say, for example, you cold outbound like a doctor's office and the office manager answers, I can't give out any information. Like, I want you to just send an email to give us a like, general office email. Here's the thing. Let's just say it's like helpdrjones.com. <laughs> Something like that, right? Now, you okay, help. Dr. Jones is probably going to be the domain. Well, the front part, can I run a few different tests? For example, can I go and can I type in potential variations of the front part of the email? Now, let's just say it's Tony Jones, Tony.Jones at drjones.com, Tony Jones at drjones.com, T.Jones. And you take that and you can throw it into, say, Gmail and see yeah. which one gets verified, right? So there's yes. many ways. My point is, like, there's not going to be one, one silver bullet. And that's a mistake I think a lot of reps make. It like, what's that one silver bullet to get through? It's not. It's a matter of being able to try multiple different ways. Like, if it's a gatekeeper, how can you be more persuasive, more influential without a gatekeeper? Okay, if you pop it in, 
How can you gain their trust faster? How can you break through the noise? How can you treat them with respect so they're actually gonna help you out? Who do you know the referrals that can help you get into the opportunity? So I think a lot of times as salespeople, we think so linearly, we're like, all right, I try to go in, door was locked. <laughs> they don't have anybody in. I try to call, <laughs> they didn't answer. I was a voicemail. I sent one email to general email. There's no way in. If it was that easy, that one touch point, one linear process can get you in, then it's gonna work every time. The point is you wanna identify number one, is it a viable opportunity? Number two, then you want to do the work to actually try to break through. And you're gonna have to mix it up depending on the situation. If it's a big healthcare system, it can be very different, right? If it's a big healthcare system, you might be calling on the C-suite instead, right? To make right. big implementation going down depending on what you sell, et cetera, right? So there's yeah. other ways to kind of leverage in, but the key is you look, when you look at each opportunity, you want to think it's kind of like ants. If you ever have ants in your house, you think your house is fine. And suddenly you have all these ants, like where does it come from? And you find, they found a weak point in your pantry and they're coming underneath because they, they smell the sugar or something, right? Well, interesting. That's a weak point. As a sales rep, it's the same thing, especially if it's a hard opportunity. What's the weak point? How can you break through? Is it through the gatekeeper? Is it through walking in? Is it through a call? Is it through multiple sources? Is it through finding them on Facebook and messaging them on Facebook? Facebook? Is it through Instagram? Is it through Twitter? So it's not necessarily linear, but if the juice is worth the squeeze, if it's a good opportunity, it's being able to think creatively on how can you best cut through the noise. And whichever medium you go through, how can you make sure the message actually resonates exactly to their benefit? Oh, yeah. So you start thinking this way, it now becomes much more powerful to actually connect with the doctor, to actually have a conversation, to actually move forward. When you are in the sales seat, I feel like a little bit of what you're talking about is also we feel so much pressure to close on that call. Mm -hmm. But really, maybe there, and I'm cheating because I've read your book and I yeah. love your process. Yeah. But can you walk people through how not every call needs to be, hi, can you give me your business? But maybe you go in for a fact-finding call as a first step. So can you share a little bit about what the different types of entry points or different calls can have, like the different purposes to eventually get you to closing a sale? Absolutely. I picture a sales process is so much, it's like sports, right? The goal, your goal is to your goal, right? To make a basket or whatever, to get to the end zone. There's a desired result you want to get to. Now, is it every single time you're going to throw a touchdown? No, no way. Like sometimes yes, but it's like the more complex the opportunity is, the less likely it's going to be a one call close, if you will. The goal is how can I, how can every, every time I have the ball, I move it down the field, right? So each step should hopefully sell the next step, depending on what's going on, right? So for example, Mm -hmm. If let's say you walk into a doctor's office and you have an, you know who the doctor is, you've never talked to them, they never call, they've never called you back, you never they never sent any emails, you know they, they open your email, but you haven't been able to break through. So maybe perhaps your first stage is gonna be okay. Let me if I pop into the office, my goal is I need to gain trust with that gatekeeper, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, they can hopefully open the calendar up and put me on the calendar, or yeah. you know, let me know when there's blank spots, if there's even any blank spots on the calendar, <laughs> or find a better way to actually catch them. And when you start yeah. thinking this way, it's like, it gets a little bit different. So for example, like you might walk in and now it's like, all right, you know, the receptionist is John, the receptionist. And now it's like, you maybe already called me before you walk in and instead of saying, I want to talk to Dr. Jones. Hey, are you John? Yeah, I'm John. They're confused now. Oh, hey, John, I'm Marcus with X. Actually, I talked to you on the phone for a little bit, right? I know it's been a crazy busy day, but is there any chance I could talk to him? No, he's busy right now. No worries. Have some, don't just like leave now. Build a little trust yeah. rapport with them, right? Yeah. Find out what, what's going on in their world. Build some confidence, build some trust here, right? Like the key is like, when we start thinking transformationally about opportunities and you realize by building some trust with John, John might now guide you to when they're available. That's really powerful, right? Because mm -hmm. if you think about this, I'll give you an example. So there will be times I'll walk in cold call, right? You're walking to the business or whatever, or even medical office, we walk in medical office as well. And you talk to the reception, they're carded. Yes. And then we, you, you talk to them for a little bit. They start opening up. I ask them some easy questions and they feel really comfortable. Oh, yeah, like, hey, do you happen to know? Like, what you guys do for X, Y, and Z? Oh, no, we got to take care of. Cool. How long are you using for? Oh, we've using for 20 years. We're really happy. We love the rest. That's great to hear. Awesome. How long have you been here for? I've been here for five years. That's amazing. I'm sure you've probably seen a lot of salespeople come in. Oh, yeah, all the time. Okay. Okay, cool. And now they're, they're kind of laughing. They'll be a little bit of trust, a little bit of conversation. Mm -hmm. And now it's so easy to kind of ask another question that's relevant to you. Hey, so I know obviously the doctor is really loyal to who they're using. Do you happen to know, based on what you've seen so far, would they be open to the conversation at all? I think so, but only if you talk about this. Oh, okay, cool. That's all you need. You just need an opening, right? Yeah. That's kind of my points. I think we think so linearly. It's like, if I don't hit this objective, then it's a dead opportunity. No, you actually build some trust and gain a you move, you move to forward. The key is being able to gain the trust as fast as possible. And I would say, the faster you can do that, the better it's going to be. So that's why it's like when you walk in, you have to be ready to go. Like you have to be ready to gain it as fast as possible. You, you can't like be moving slow. And, oh, I was trying to get hold of Dr. It's like, 
<laughs> Jones, who are you? So this is where it's like, once the game timer starts, you got to be on. Yes. And we started thinking this way. You start each stage we moves forward because now it's like, okay, that stage is sold. You, you move to progress. Like, oh, they usually come in early on Fridays before 8 a.m. You get some paperwork done. So, you know, if you happen to be here around that time, you might be able to catch him. That's all I need to know. <laughs> now yeah. I'm there at seven o'clock, right? I wait outside the door yes. like, to catch them for even a quick conversation. And right. again, let's see, I mean, me at 7 a.m. I'm not necessarily there trying to run a discovery process or present anything. It may be just to set up a time and build a little bit of trust. Again, moving this each stage forward. So every stage you go into, it may not be linear, but once you're in that stage, what's your desired outcome? How can you move forward? If you're in discovery, it might be purely fact finding, which then you can send another follow-up call as well to bring some samples, have a conversation, bring you over collateral or documentation that they may want to see, other case studies, use cases, etc. So they feel more comfortable with you. So every single step should have a goal to move forward. But again, it's not toward necessarily ideal that the, the goal is to close, but can you move it towards closing? Can you move it down the field? And when you start thinking yeah. that way, you start playing the long game. One thing I love that you talk a lot about as far as who are the top performers in sales of all industries and specifically with your clients too, is they spend the majority of their time prospecting and qualifying who they're going to mm -hmm. speak with. Because right. I remember the early days of being in the field and the answer to, oh, you're not developing enough business was make more calls. <laughs> and yeah. it's a circle, it's a trap. So yeah. can you take me from when, so instead of calling on that same person that you just got through the gatekeeper, now you found when that doctor is going to be in the office on Friday, what mm. should I be doing between when I heard he's going to be in the office and when I'm sitting in my car at 7 a.m. on Friday, what kind of ways can I research and do that qualifying so that when in that game time starts, I can be ready. Cool. So I think there's, there's a few different ways. There's, there's like emotional preparation to gain emotional trust. And there's like logical preparation. Like logical preparations, like taking a look at even in your CR, what details do you have about the notes? Any past calls? Is there anything online you can learn about the doctor that's relevant to the field that you're in? Have you been part of conferences or anything else like that? That's like very logical. So anything, any detail that's going to help you potentially gain trust faster from a business perspective, that's what you want to find out. That could be press releases. It could be checking out their social media, see what they're posting about. If they're active on there. Some are not. It varies, right? But you do whatever. Like it's 2022 as right now, right? Maybe 2023 when you actually listen yeah. to this, but it's like you could search and find about anything by anyone right now, right? So you gain yeah. some of that business perspective, right? And that by itself, you already have the game. Now, here's the thing. At the end of the day, generally speaking, most doctors are very ego driven. Most people are as driven, etc. So now what else can you find out about them that will help gain trust very quickly that's going to be relevant to them, right? Take a look at their social media. Have they posted anything? Maybe they got voted number one doctor in the Pacific Northwest, right? Number one pediatrician in the Pacific Northwest by whatever <laughs> organization, right? Or maybe other cool things they post about recently. Take a look at their Facebook page. Take a look at any of their social media handles for the organization. What have they put out recently? Because usually it's probably important to them, right? So if you saw a big healthcare system, System, and you that the healthcare system had published their most recent article that's getting a lot of buzz, you want to know what that is, yeah. right? So depending on how small or big, you want to do your homework in advance knowing about what's going on in their world, what's most important to them. And sometimes it's really clear and evident, and sometimes it's not as clear. So you do your best, right? But then you can also uncover some of the personal components too. Like if, for example, like just it's small basic stuff that like mm -hmm. you, know, you find out even, it's so silly, like you find out like what sports teams are into. Yeah. Other things are important to them. How can you slip that in? You uncover their family person. How can you incorporate that in your conversation? Yes. And I think a mistake a lot of people make is walk and they're like, oh, hey, so I see you're a fisherman. Cool, me too. I'm a fisherman <laughs> too. Awesome. That's very general, right? Well, imagine you, you booking me that doctor or you're in the hallway, you're talking a little bit. It's like, hey, how's it going? It's going and you have some conversation and you're wrapping the meeting up and you know, it, it's like, hey, so you got any plans for the weekend he's like, oh i'm gonna go i got some kids stuff too and you're like, yeah cool me too actually i got two boys at home we're actually gonna be going camping doing this this weekend they're over here by this river ever been there oh no that sounds amazing now it's boom you're starting to build some emotional trust and rapport based off of that so i think the mistake it's like the way you think about it, everything that you do in a sales call from the preparation to that point will either gain trust or decrease trust so if not to be the true what could you find out up front to actually improve what happens on that call. So it's not always gonna be like, I need to find these things every single time because sometimes it simply won't be available. Especially if you call on like a doctor that's been like, let's say you look at their website, you can tell if he in like 99, <laughs> right? They may not have updated it. So right. you're limited, right? So you gotta take what you right. can in terms of what you can prepare, get the best gathering of the situation, and then you yeah. just do your best in conversation. But more importantly, what questions can you prepare now? So if you don't have a lot of details, what questions yes. can you prepare? What do you want to find out? So it's not what you say, but also what do you ask? And it's What's not, can I them? check samples? 
else. Exactly. It's not enough. Yeah. Exactly. You want to be like transformational about it. Right? For example, you find a doctor that maybe has worked for a big healthcare system 20 years. So they've seen this, the changes across the board. How powerful is it? Hey, so listen, since you've been a podiatrist for 20 plus years, you've seen the evolution and you've been here at Legacy Hospital for that long. What have been some of the coolest things you've seen in the last 20 years? Mm -hmm. How about the most recent innovations? Or if you're studying the industry trends, you want to bring that up. Hey, I know this is a bit controversial because they just came out with X procedure. I'm mm -hmm. definitely curious. What are your thoughts? Oh, so mm. good, Marcus. Those so, are the, um, that make you stand out. Yes, exactly. And it comes back to knowing your customer and what their goals are, right? Mm -hmm. We can help them achieve those things. I remember when I was working for Agendia, which is a molecular diagnostic company for women's health. And the physicians are, oncologists are always being presented new mm -hmm. and exciting technology to help mm -hmm. direct their care. If it's going to be radio, if it's going to be chemo or all kinds of things. And so our test would help them. But the thing is, they are so bombarded with all of these different options that mm -hmm. it was a huge weight off their shoulders that our team had a group of a customer's care group that would mm -hmm. explain the results and explain the test to his patients. So then mm -hmm. suddenly they are bought into the test. Yes, but they can focus on diagnosis, which is this is going to mean for your family, what it's going to mean mm -hmm. for your recovery and the details of the test, which he may or may not know to a certain degree, it's all handled. Mm -hmm. Took that off their plates. And I just remember that being something that was really helpful for oncologists. And the only reason that we did it was because we knew that they have to explain so much in a short amount of time with that patient that if we could help take some of the load off, it would be a win. And it was a huge help. Powerful. Yeah. I'm thinking about it, even if it's just like you asked, what's your current process for doing your current process for doing X? How does it impact you? How could that be improved? Yeah. And they're just telling Telling, they're telling these type of things like you just mentioned. It's like, oh, cool. So now it's like, oh my gosh, it's, it's painful. We only have three minutes. I explain this whole process for them. If they feel overwhelmed, if they're emotional already because of what's going on and they get mad at me. So now you have all, all it's very powerful because you're actually uncovering what's actually going on in the world. So then from there, it's, it's amazing how when you show them a solution, it's like a no brainer now. This makes yeah. sense. Like, of course, you take it all from me. Great. And detach it from what our sale is to what they really need. I think that's Correct. something that I hear of often is that. That's that's not going to help me sell my product, but it's going to increase the trust and you build that goodwill and that reciprocal nature with that target. So with that client, you help them and then the trust is there when you have something to bring to the table. I think that's a really powerful concept. So a lot of times people just focus on the short-term benefit, but they don't focus on the long-term impact, right? So let's go back to even your example right there. Like you just reduce the stress of the doctor. Yeah. So they're not stressed. The patients are happier. They get support. The doctor is able to provide the help. If they want to help their patients. They will help provide the next level of care. That's powerful. So when they're less stressed, they can take better care of the patients. They can focus more on other patients as well. They can serve more people. There becomes all these other benefits as a result of what you sold them. And the mistake people make is like, oh, this solves one single problem. And you can apply this concept to literally anything. So for example, like you look at say like this water bottle, if you're watching the video, like this water bottle, it's, it seems like nothing for most people. Oh, it's a water bottle. But for me, it's not just a water bottle. It's how I stay hydrated. When I stay hydrated, I feel better. When I feel better, Better, I perform better. So it's not just all these questions about therapy. It's like this water bottle helps me. Oh, also helps me reduce going back and forth because it's a huge bottle. So it saves me time. It makes me more productive. Yeah. Interesting. That's probably not what people buy a water bottle for, but that's why I buy a water, <laughs> water bottle. Yeah. Can I add a fringe benefit to that water please, bottle? Please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so we got one of those as well. And yeah. recently we just cut a Christmas tree in our house. We're yeah. recording this before Christmas, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a long water bottle. So it's yeah. easier to fill the tree with. See? That, many, that's, so, many benefits. That's my point. So a lot of times, like, I think it's like when people look at one thing, they're like, oh, interesting. Like, even like my book, people are like, it's not just like a book to, oh, it's some neat tips. It's ultimately, if you do what's in the book, you'll make more money. You have more time right. freedom. You do whatever you want. That's why people want to get better at sales. They don't want to get sell, just get better at selling. Right. They want to get better at selling so they can create the life that they want. That's just right. reality. For most folks who are listening to this podcast right now, they're in medical sales or in some part of sales that touches healthcare. And what I find is often they will transition in and out of other types of sales. So they'll go for SaaS for a while, they'll do other kinds. And then many of them come back to medical sales because they really get a thrill from knowing that they touched a patient's life. Yeah. And 
So at the end of the day, we've got to overcome that feeling of if I'm improving and becoming a better salesperson, am I becoming more salesy? No, you're helping more people because you're better at your craft. And so that's what I really appreciate about your book and all the things that you share, because you make it a playbook and a step-by-step system that people can follow and they can improve themselves beyond what they're taught at their corporate training, which goes so far and only lasts a week or two every Every year. So it really does pay, I've found, to invest in these alternate good sales coaching because if you commit to it in this lifelong way, the effect that you'll have on other people in any industry and certainly in medical sales is incredible. You're so spot on, right? Where I look at every career, it's a choice. You either look at it as a craft or just a job. Right? And when you look at it as a craft, and especially when you're able to see the bigger picture, because you're spot on, if you truly believe in the healthcare solution, Solution that you sell that you will positively impact someone's life. And it doesn't have to be like necessarily any crazy. It could be a simple medical device for a foot, right? But if that's going to make the life of someone's grandmother, grandfather way easier because of that, so they can have more time with their family and kids and actually run and play with them, you change their life, right? And when you start thinking this way, you realize it's actually your duty to sell at the highest level. Because when you sell the highest level, you are serving at the highest level. Exactly. And so, well, first of all, Marcus, thank you so much for joining me today. Every time I talk to you, you drop (laughs) gems and strategy. Today, some of my favorites specifically were you do not get paid to be comfortable. So that is something we all can be reminded of now and then, right? So important. I love how you approach getting access to hard to reach people so creatively. See if you can figure out their email, Mm -hmm. try some things and see if they work. And I love how you help people to really focus in on making better quality, doing better and higher quality tasks instead of a greater quantity. Mm -hmm. And I think that can apply everywhere. So I know I'm inspired. I love your book. I've shamelessly promoted it so much. You know how much I love you. And I'm so glad you're up here in the Pacific Northwest with me. Can you tell anyone who's listening to the show or watching the show today where they can connect with you and find out more? Awesome. So you head over to LinkedIn. I'm pretty popular on LinkedIn. Head over there. Look at my name, Marcus Chan. You can also go to closewithchan.com. Get a copy of my book for free to pay for shipping and handling. That's probably the easiest place to get that. Or just, you can just Google me, right? It sounds weird. You can just Google me, but you'll probably see me pop up on the top of search as well. That'll be easy to find too. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. And for everybody listening, please be sure to let us know what your thoughts were about today's conversation in the comments and do yourself a favor, grab Marcus's book today and make sure you are following him right away. Thank you so much again, Marcus. It's so great to see you and I appreciate your time. My pleasure. All right, till next time, we'll see you later.